then mute it on top. Most of us have heard about it has become 
uh, much more prevalent, and we also think in, in the next five to seven years, because there's treatment options like hepatitis C, fatty liver is going to be the number one cause for cirrhosis and liver failure in the US. Um, obstructive sleep apnea, uh, apnea hyperventilation. Um, in patients with severe BMI of over 40, the chest weight basically prevents them being able to take deep breaths, especially when they are lying flat, and that can lead to a multiple complicator. Um, acid reflux disease is much more common uh, in patients with obesity, also disease. Cancers. Most cancers are much more prevalent in obese individuals, and then treatment response is much lower when you're overweight or obese. Uh, blood clots, um, your extremity swelling due to incompetent brain, kidney stones, kidney disease, incontinence, um, skin condition, uh, abnormal hormone conditions such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, hypogonadism in men, fertility issues, uh, bowel. Osteoarthritis, which is like degenerative arthritis or age-related arthritis. We used to think that obesity added a mechanical burden to a patient with arthritis, but we know that in obese patients there are a lot of inflammatory markers that's like skyrocketing in their circulating plasma. Like these are much more we learned so much more about these in the last couple of years. There are hormones called IL6 and IL12, including tumor necrosis factors, and these circulating hormones are much higher in patients with obesity leading to not only the mechanical damage to the joint, there is an inflammatory damage further on top of that because of it. Uh, much more, um, the prevalence of depression and depression associates that complications is two and a half times higher in patients with obesity than age-matched non-obese patients. And um, surgical treatment has much higher complications in patients who are overweight and obese. Feel free to stop me as we go along, and in between, I have a few questions. I would like your uh, participation as well. Uh, so this is like a, a, the same previous slide showing all the complications of obesity in uh, form. So when, we, when it comes to patients, the first thing is basically, um, after 2000 in US and even all over the country, we thought obesity was a problem of being lazy and not exercising sufficiently and overeating. Um, luckily, that turned around in 2000 because it's not, um, there is multiple factors. 60% of the burden is outside of the patient's control of uh, uh, obesity. It's genetic predisposition. So if they, if you, when you look at identical twins, there is a 90% concordance of obesity among twins. Even when they were raised in different circumstances or different states, there is a more than 75% that they are going to be obese. They follow the identical twin that the parents do. So there is a genetic predisposition to obesity. There are other genetic heritable uh, things that control weight as well. How our basal metabolic rate is determined throughout the day is very genetically different. Some people have a high, much higher basal metabolic rate than people uh, others. You could step up your basal metabolic rate by exercising the routinely, but even the step up is genetically determined. Some people by just being fidgeted throughout the day, they burn much more calories than another person who works out in say three for an hour. Uh, the, what's called the, term, the amount of energy needed to burn food, right? the thermal energy that we use to burn food is much higher in different individuals. Some people with the burn basically anywhere from 600 to 700 calories, eating the same food, having the same basal metabolic rate, and having the same BMI, some people may burn three times, three times more calories than others. So there are multiple factors that genetically predetermined that make it harder for people to lose weight or for predisposing, or predisposing uh, to gain weight. Then there is this group of other conditions called epigenetics. A, a baby that's under, uh, below age for age, uh, the fetus under age for the fetal development has much higher risk for developing obesity as well as overweight for gestational age. Similarly, a newborn that's less than five pounds and more than eight pounds has much higher risk for weight gain up to the age of 30, not as newborns, not as infants, but even up to the age of 30, there is much. It's thought to be uh, when the mother has more weight gain or has a big, smaller baby or higher baby, there is a lot of insulin that the baby has to promote either to accelerate growth or slow the growth down. And that leads to insulin resistance. And then that effect can last up to 30 years after the birth of the baby. So first we diagnose obesity. 
We usually use BMI to diagnose obesity, and um, uh, so it, all our electronic medical records now automatically generate the BMI if we put in the patient's height and weight. The uh, once the OB, uh, BMI is there, we have to collect data. What are the conditions that the patient has who's overweight? Uh, meaning, what is the blood pressure? Um, do they suffer from arthritis? What is it? What is their blood sugar? What do their lipids look like? Do they have fatty liver? Are they snoring? Do they have uh, hypersomnolence? Meaning, when you stop at the traffic light, do you fall asleep because you don't get enough sleep, restful sleep uh, because of obstructive sleep apnea? So you evaluate for conditions related to obesity, and then we make management decisions. Study motivational interviews. This is a very sensitive subject. I could tell 100 patients that your blood pressure is high and what to do about it, and nobody gets offended. But a patient comes in with high blood pressure, and then I tell them that your BMI falls into the obesity class one, very often they get offended or hurt, because all their life they've been told that they're heavy, they're obese, they're chubby, and now you as a physician are again labeling. So it makes sense to ask them permission when it comes to such a sensitive topic. Do you know what a BMI is? Is it okay for me to talk about your BMI during this visit? And get the patient engaged about it, then right off the bat, offending that guy saying, you know, what you're heavy, what do you want to do, what do you eat, uh, you know, cut down calories. Um, and that's where the motivational interviewing comes in. I'll talk a little bit more about it later on. And then we do nutritional intervention, physical activity, behavior therapy, counselor therapy, and bariatric procedures. Um, what are the important things in history when you look at people with obesity? If you talk to them more, and then we collect data, these are some of the important things that we found out. When you look at uh, adults who watch TV for more than 20 hours a week, the prevalence of obesity was 55%. As opposed to in, uh, in a population where they watch TV for less than five hours a week, the prevalence is 10%, 11 to 15%. That's staggering, right? So um, is it because the certain group of patients are so active that they are not watching TV? Or we don't know, with, you know, which is a hen or egg, but this is just statistics I'm trying to show. Um, here are some of the other certainly environmental factors, right? Most of us have computer-based jobs, even in medicine now, as opposed to writing notes now, everything has to be charted electronically. We spend long hours in front of the computer. So when people are in front of the computer for more than 10 hours a week, there is significantly higher odds of obesity. As a is it outside the work? Yeah. yeah. It's work plus recreation. Oh. That's very little, right? You work for eight hours in front of the computer. And oh, we are screwed. That's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, so we'll talk about a few techniques that's coming out, even to work on the computer. Um, as opposed to people who, you know, when we had the paper chart and when we used to uh, like work and write, or people read books, there was a much lower prevalence of obesity among people who worked on books for 10 hours or read books for more than 10 hours. Yes. Didn't correlate with obesity, yeah. but time to not the sedentary lifestyle. Because if you compare, in other words, uh, if I'm doing a computer work, you were doing a green, two hours, you were doing for two hours, and the person was on the computer more likely. That's exactly right. right. The person on the computer is much more likely to suffer from obesity than the person. I think it has a lot to do with how much concentration you can pay to reading where you have to sort of change position, move your head, you're constantly fidgeting when you're reading as opposed to computer. You go from one screen to your email screen to your Facebook screen and then come back the same day with much less physical activity and much more concentration on what you're physically without distraction. So another thing, yeah, a lot of time now the reading is done on computer. That's exactly, so you're better off going to the old paper book and flipping pages <laughs> than using the book on the iPad. Uh, that's exactly right. So there are, these are some of the things that we are losing as the technology advances that protected us you know, in the past from obesity. For people who read a lot, does it make sense you have a book, you know, you can't hold the book in front, you change your position, you move your head, and you don't have, you get bored a little bit, so you move, you walk around, as opposed to when you get bored with working on the iPad, what do you do? Then you look at Facebook, 
right there by just one finger click. And then you come back to the computer screen again without any other um, pain. similar BMI, similar sex, and then they compared to people who would like, as a recreational, they spent eight hours working on computers, and then they did recreational book reading versus recreational computer work. And then they found um, Here's where we play a huge role. We as physicians and nurse practitioners, and um, uh, uh, we contribute also significantly to say some medications that contribute to weight gain. Um, there are weight neutral antidepressants. Prozac is the number one weight neutral antidepressant. There are weight uh, medications that help with weight loss, which are antidepressants like Wellbutrin can help with weight loss, which is an antidepressant. But there are most of the other antidepressants like Celexa, Lexapro, Zoloft, they all cause you to gain, gain weight. So antidepressants make you gain weight. Atypical antipsychotics, which are used a lot when depression becomes difficult to treat, or in patients with bipolar disorder, or uh, uh, psychosis, especially if you've heard about Zyprexa or Serca, these atypical antipsychotics in the first two years cost 17 pounds weight gain each year. So we are causing significant problems as well. So sometimes you're treating a difficult disease with medications that, that have got about side effects, but you need to talk to the patient, and then you need to get the patient motivated to be able to do some other form of more aggressive lifestyle changes than you're starting them or get them to uh, get involved with weight loss programs. Antihypertensive. More, a lot of patients are on beta blockers. This group of the common ones are atinolol, lopressor, metoprolol. These basically lower your heart rate as well as your basal metabolic rate. So in patients who've been on it for 10 to 11 years compared to other blood pressure medications like ACE inhibitor, which is lysinopril or catropyl, they basically, be, uh, after 10 to 11 years, the patients on beta blockers gained about 12 pounds compared to the patients on the other medicines. Uh, so much so, the new blood pressure guidelines say not to start beta blockers as a first-line agent unless there is a special reason because they drop your heart rate drop your metabolic rate, and your ability to increase your heart rate with exercise is also blunted. Um, diabetic medications such as insulin and sulfonylureas, these are liberides, lipicides, amaryl, they make you gain weight, but there are diabetic medications that are newer, that are weight neutral, or have, can help with weight loss. DLC-1 analogs, they are basically injectable, they can be once a day or once a week injectable. They're not insulin, so they don't drop your blood sugar below normal. They can help with weight loss. Uh, much less than insulin. It's expensive because they are newer, but long, so much so that it has been, it has, uh, I'll talk a little bit later, the medication that has gotten approval for weight loss, it has to go through very stringent because of the problems we had with Tencent in the past, and this has gotten approval for weight loss even in non-diabetics. Unfortunately, the problem is that it's expensive because they are newer, they're not Tencent. Um, that forming is weight neutral. Some people do lose weight. Uh, that's again a diabetic medication. Um, antiretroviral medications called lipodystrophy, meaning you can gain weight around your belly area, um, especially with HIV medications. Steroid hormones, um, especially when you use long term prednisone for patients with lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, chronic lung disease, that causes for uh, weight gain. Contraceptives, especially the long acting, high dose uh, contraceptives, cause weight gain. Uh, the lower dose birth control pill is very effective, very nice, but they have limitations. In patients over 165 pounds, the efficacy of these birth control pill goes down. So then you're using higher um, dose birth control pill in women who are already struggling with weight and adding to their burden. So we are also causing uh, a problem. All right, uh, uh, certain things that, when we examine these patients, so uh, BMI is the easiest quick way, and uh, fortunately, if the weight is there and the height is there, it's automatically calculated, so it doesn't take extra time in a 20 minute visit with, uh, with the doctor. So at least get the BMI calculated, and we should uh, ask the patient permission to be able to talk about the BMI. 
So normal BMI is 18.5 to 24.9. That's ideal body weight. 25 to 30 is called overweight. 30 to 35 is class one. Class two is 35 to 40. And above 40 is severe obesity. Uh, BMI is used to determine who qualifies for weight loss medication and who qualifies for weight loss surgery. So it's useful not only that, it's also useful to calculate risks and benefits of treatment as well. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't take into account gender array, body composition, and fat distribution. Body composition meaning uh, patients have the pair type of fat distribution where they're heavier in the proximal thigh and hip. They have much less risk for developing diabetes and heart disease as opposed to patients that are belly fat. So that type of fat directly increases your inflammatory markers and risk for heart problems. So it doesn't take into account those uh, things. So we use other parameters. Um, the waist circumference is a very good measurement to, uh, and a tool to use to assess body fat in the belly distribution. So for men, if they are waist circumference, it's measured at the superior iliac heights, up at the upper limit of your bone, in the, uh, your pelvic bone, instead of the belly button, because in some patients who are very heavy, the belly button can be much lower. So we use a bone marker when not the belly button. So 40 inches in men and 35 inches in women. Um, over time with practice, I found it useful only in patients between BMI of 25 to 35, mainly because sometimes you will see football players or very athletic soccer players, whether it's men or women, coming in and their BMI can be 27, 30, but they're muscular individuals. They're not, they don't have any body fat too. So in those individuals, measuring the waist circumference makes sense then to talk to them about weight loss and weight management. Unfortunately, when the uh, patient is above 35, the BMI, measuring itself, can be very difficult because what we use is this disposable paper tape that's basically 30 to 60 inches long. So when you look at a woman or a man and you're measuring, the tape doesn't go around and then it becomes a little bit difficult and embarrassing and difficult to these patients when you're trying to hug them or get them to go around so you can get the weight. Um, as much as you have to be very sensitive about these issues, otherwise you're going to turn the patient off and they're not committed to the process because They've been humiliated and kicked down so many times, you don't want to be the last person to prevent them from getting the fat cell cell disease program. Um, this is called a melancholy score. You ask the patient to open the mouth big and wide and put their tongue out, but not say, yeah, can you open your mouth as wide and big as possible and stick your tongue out? And when you do that in normal individuals, you shouldn't be able to see the uvula, the thing that hangs in the back of your uh, throat, all the way from where it's attached to the soft palate to the tip of it. That's the class one. Class four is when you don't see the uvula at all. In patients with class three and class four, they have pretty significant risk for obstructive sleep apnea because the back of their throat is already narrow. And when they go into sleep, especially REM sleep, and your muscle starts relaxing, the tongue drops back and completely cuts off your breathing. And your oxygen level drops. That leads to daytime hypersomnolence, meaning you can fall asleep very easily during the daytime fatigue, leading to first seven pound weight gain when you treat, uh, you patients lose about seven pounds in the first couple of years when you treat obstructive sleep apnea. So assessing and if they're at risk, the best thing would be to ask the partner, does your husband snow or does your wife snow? Have you ever felt that the snoring suddenly stops and the patient stops breathing, right? Those are some of the things that might be useful as well. And then we, um, get them to see a, deep, a specialist and get the treatment. Unfortunately, with the treatment, the obstructive uh, sleep apnea, the CPAP machine is cumbersome. People hate it. Only about 50% of the patients are able to tolerate it. But there are newer machines that's coming out much easier to use. It's over the nose and it automatically is able to say how often you're complying and give you data. So it's, it's, it's becoming more uh, palatable. Um, so the, uh, the next is a question. So this is a 54-year-old woman with a BMI of 31. So she call, falls into the obesity class one category, present for a physical exam. Which is um, um, which of the following is the most appropriate initial recommendation for weight loss? So somebody, I mean, a BMI of 31 is not an unusual thing. A lot of patients are suffering from it. A lot of us are suffering. So she comes in and uh, wants to know some advice about weight loss. So you're recommending weight loss of 20% for current, uh, of current weight in six months. So that's about 45 pound weight reduction per week. Or you assess previous attempts at weight loss before recommending an option. 
or reduction in calorie intake below 1,000 kilocalories per day for a month in terms of the weight loss. Uh, the last option is to for the geriatric patients for geriatric surgery consultants. Any ideas? Feet shape. Feet shape. Exactly. Um, so the, and you're talking about four to five pound weight loss, that's too drastic. It will not be something that you can maintain long term. So uh, the best option would be to try and find out what worked in the past. What, you know, what did you do, what worked, and why did that fail, right? And try to build from there, or come up with what never worked, like, you know, and then don't go back and do the same thing that has failed in the past. So a first and previous attempt would be the best one. If a patient comes and says that, you know, they are, uh, say their weight is now 180, their ideal body weight is 130, and they come to you wanting to say, I want to get to my ideal body weight, right? That's awesome. But here's what they, that's what sets uh, us up for failure, because you want to lose 70, 80 pounds, and if you don't reach that, then you get so frustrated and you give up, and then you continue to gain weight. So what we're trying to show is, about losing five to six, 10% of your body weight in six to seven months or even one year, and trying to weigh, maintain the weight loss is what, what we call the healthy option because that improves all the metabolic conditions. It improves blood pressure, it improves sugar, it improves lipids, it improves incontinence, it improves heat apnea. So it, it improves so much that you don't, if the patient wants to lose 70 pounds, you have to sort of try and direct them to see. Here's the benefit for your blood pressure, cholesterol, lipids. So let's aim for using 10% in the first six months and then at least maintaining it over the next few years or if the more weight loss is able to. So when you lose 3% of your initial body weight, your glycemic, your blood sugars improve basically. And uh, your risk for developing diabetes, if you have, a, uh, if you have gestational diabetes, that means if you, during pregnancy, if you ever had uh, diabetes and now you don't, you have a 50% chance of developing diabetes. Similarly, if you're a pre-diabetic, you have a much higher chance of. So by losing 3%, you delay the onset or you are able to prevent developing diabetes. 5% weight loss improves blood pressure, uh, blood sugar, and also your cholesterol. 10% achieve much more greater improvement in sugar, reduction in blood pressure medication, reduction in diabetic medication, and then patients lost more than 15%, even greater. So the, the best benefit is trying to lose 10% and maintaining the weight loss. And also when patients lost more than 5% of their body weight, mechanical stuff like stress incontinence, heat apnea improved. Um, so 10% weight loss improved osteoarthritis, cancer went down, coronary artery disease, blood clots, diabetes. So all these chronic medical problems that's related to obesity improve significantly with 10% um, So the treatment of obesity, so even though I put it like a stepwise, it doesn't necessarily have to be a stepwise approach. Sometimes what happens when we talk about these conditions is we become sort of lazy. We talk about nutrition, then three months later they come back and they gain one or two pounds. Then we refer the patient to a dietitian. The patient goes, in our uh, system sometimes, if the patient goes to a weight management program like what UCI offers, they are able to get in quickly and get the close attention they need. But on the other hand, when they go to a referred insurance covered dietitian, it takes a month and a half to get in, and then they meet them one time for 20 minutes, and then three months later the patient comes back and has gained them. So you don't have to follow this in a stepwise. It makes sense to start all three, all four at the same time, and get the patient not frustrated and motivated with their weight loss. So uh, nutrition is important, physical activity. What happens with nutrition is you can coach somebody significantly and teach them about better diet. And most of us have access to this knowledge through electronic uh, this. The problem is sticking to it, right? That's where behavior therapy comes in. How do you get your patient to stick to the program long term? The longer they stick, the better success they get. And then there is pharmacotherapy, endoscopic intervention. So there are several centers in the all in all of the US that are doing endoscopic interventions for weight loss, and UCI is one of those centers. So we are really lucky that we have all these um, access to healthcare within our um, backyard and bariatric surgery as well. And our program is um, what's called a bariatric surgery certified program, where they have very low mortalities and very high. 
from what diet are you going to, uh, you know, whether you want to lose five pounds after you made your New Year's resolution, or whether you want to lose 10% of your initial body weight, which can be 50 or 60 pounds. So what diet are you going to choose? So based on everything that we've tried, anybody wants to guess which diet was the best? Exactly. The one that you're able to follow, or the one that you're able to stick to, right? So I'm a vegetarian. If somebody comes and tells me to try like a South Beach diet or an Atkins diet, I can't do it because most of my protein comes from legume and lot of yogurt, which also has a lot of carbs, right? So I can't follow an Atkins or South Beach type of diet. On the other hand, when they cook their low carb diet, basically patients are able to get better weight loss at six months. But if you follow them over one year, everybody has similar weight loss, similar improvement in blood sugar. What helps is a person who sticks longer. The patients who enroll on Weight Watchers repeatedly every year, year after year, are the most amount of success. So they are much more, uh, either somebody is motivating or they are self-motivating, or the program is motivating to stick. So what, it doesn't matter what diet you choose, it's the diet that you are able to follow and stick to long term that they're going to. Here's one thing, so they looked at people and they asked 50 people, so you want to lose 10 pounds, what kind of diet would you like to, do you want to choose like a high protein, uh, medium amount of fat diet, or you want to go with a low um, fat, low protein, a healthy carb diet? And then they gave the patients the option, and then the second group of patients were not given options. You told them that they had to follow like an Atkins diet or a Mediterranean diet. So the weight loss was similar when the patient had a choice or didn't have a choice. But what helps in, when it comes to diet is the diet that you pick or the diet you continue to follow. And then the longer you follow is when you're more successful. Just to remind when uh, patients have elevated blood pressure, we tend to recommend the DASH diet. It's basically about integrated dietary approaches to stopping hypertension. It has the, um, the biggest thing is um, how many portions of fruits and vegetables do most of us have in a day? Three to four, and the DASH recommends seven to eight portions of fruits and vegetables. Um, and then the Mediterranean diet, this is what the common diet that follows in olive growing parts of the Mediterranean. So it's basically um, complex carb uh, from legumes and complex carbohydrates, 70% protein and 43% fat, which is usually higher than most diets recommended in the US, but the um, fat comes from monosaturated, unsaturated. Um, this is what I said about at two years, it didn't matter what diet, it's the diet that if you stuck to the diet, it works. So when we classify diet, um, some people ask about, especially young people are able to, uh, young meaning I'm talking about 18 to uh, even mid 50s, people are able to follow what's called, um, it's becoming very popular, like a starvation diet, meaning you could eat reasonably healthy about five days of the week, and then you pick two days in the middle of the week when you don't work out or you don't eat. Like it's usually Tuesday, Thursday, and those days you really cut back on calorie intake to like 600, 700, or 800 calories because it, that. So people they always wonder how could you do that? That's starvation. And then certain religious uh, this thing um, for Hindus like five days of fasting days. So it makes you skipped basically you know two meals and had one. So there are various things, but the starvation diet or eating very low calorie one day or two day and eating healthy the other day also has been shown to work. But the problem is when you uh, cut back calories to less than 800, it's not something that is sustainable. You can't keep it up beyond a four month period, a four week period. So it makes sense if somebody has, needs an urgent surgery like a ventral, uh, like a uh, abdominal hernia or they need arthritis uh, joint replacement. And the surgeons nowadays say, if you don't lose 50 pounds, we can't do the surgery, the surgery will stay. Uh, hernias come back 50% of the time within six months if you don't lose 50 pounds and if you're unable to. So in those conditions, or if somebody needs knee replacement because they've now become dead drawn because of horrible knee pain, then it makes sense to be able to put them on a low calorie diet, uh, uh, like they're in restrict calories to 800 or so for four weeks to get in that, um, they, by putting them on a very low calorie diet for four weeks, people can lose 15 to 20 pounds in a four week uh, time. So there is a role for it, but it's not something we routinely recommend because relapses are very common. Um, most of the time, what we follow is a, cal a calorie diet between um, 1,200 to 
1500, which is like a low calorie diet, um, or above 1500, which is like about if you. Um, um, so we did this uh, at UCI, one of the dietitians who had the UCI Bake program and some of the medicals. So we um, went out and asked undergraduates, medical students, dietitian students, residents, and hospital attendees uh, to estimate the consumption of calories and how much they burn with physical activity. What we found is even people in healthcare overestimated their physical activity by 50%. And underestimated food intake by 30%. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, next slide, please. Right, so, meal replacement diet. So, a lot of uh, weight loss programs recommend this meal replacement diet. It's usually like a portion control, meaning there's two shakes. So, I'll give you options for shakes that we recommend, and two meal replacements, two entrees. And then you can get, get anywhere from four to uh, seven servings of fresh fruits and vegetables without dressing, without caramel, without sugar. <laughs> so the shakes that can be used, uh, HMR, the Health Management Resources Shakes, um, our UCI Waste Management Program offers it, so you could use one of those shakes. You can use some of the store-bought shakes, like Premier is a high-protein, high-fiber, low-carb shake that's available at Costco and Walmart, you can use those. You can use uh, Slim Fast, you know, cheap. It's a Kirkland, the Costco brand, equal, which is even cheaper. So you will have a shake for breakfast. And then you have a shake or one of their protein bars as a snack between breakfast, lunch, half of it between breakfast, lunch, and half as a snack between lunch and dinner. And then you have one of the meal replacements. HMR meal replacements are handy because they're vacuum packed. So you can carry it around without having to freeze them. Or you can buy Weight Watchers, Lean Cuisine, or Smart One meals. And then you'll have an entree for lunch and then an entree for dinner. And you can have, um, we recommend going with like a, a, a cup of, uh, you know, whatever fresh greens um, that you like. And then you could steam half a cup of frozen vegetables, and that's your two servings of vegetables. Similarly, you will add more fruits and vegetables with dinner. So this is what's called portion control replacement. And in this huge study where they looked at basically about 800,000 patients who are at higher risk for developing diabetes because they had a very strong family history and they were overweight or obese, or they were found to have pre-diabetes where their fasting blood sugars were high, or your hemoglobin A1C was high, or they had gestational diabetes with a risk of developing diabetes um, that was 50% higher. So they looked, they divided this group uh, into three, and the first group basically got lifestyle counseling about being more physically active, reducing calories. Um, and then the second group got lifestyle counseling, fasted medication called metformin, which we thought can delay the onset of diabetes. So we wanted to try it out. So the second group got that. And the third group got meal replacement. They got two shakes worth and two meals and six, seven servings of fresh fruits and vegetables. Guess which group did the best? The meal replacement group did the best. They delayed onset of diabetes, got much better blood pressure and blood sugar control. And the benefits lasted when they followed these patients up to two years, and now they're, con they're continuing to follow them to see how long the benefit lasted. So the, the, the study was for six months, and the benefit lasted even two years after the study. So um, it is important whenever you lose, whether it's five pounds or 30 pounds, about 25% of that is fat. 25% is lean body mass, that's bone and muscle. Right? So you have to be, uh, when you're losing large amount of weight, you have to be able to help them to lose less uh, lean mass, less bone and muscle. So cutting it down to less than 5% and losing 95% fat is helpful. How can you do with that? You can do that by getting adequate protein when you're restricting calories, and also physical activity when you're doing that. So adequate protein, when you're restricting calories to less than 1,200, we recommend at least one gram per kilogram of ideal body weight of protein. But if you are allowing the patient to have more than 1,200, then we recommend one to 1.5 gram of uh, protein for ideal body weight. Physical activity. So we all want to know how much and how, how often do we do, right, physical activity. So the next question. For a patient uh, seeking counseling, prior to starting an exercise program, which of the following is the most appropriate Exercise alone, without dietary changes, typically results in significant weight loss of about three to five kilograms a week. Exercise has been shown to result in significant weight loss, but not as important for weight maintenance. 
lifestyle activities such as housework or parking the car further from the stove can again impact the health benefits. C. So this was proven beyond. So they looked at people who did moderate physical activity. My next slide I'll talk about what is moderate physical activity. So people who did moderate physical activity five times per week for an hour, and then they compared it to people who were very active throughout the day, who walked for work, or who basically got, uh, they, throughout the day they stayed active. Housewives with kids, uh, where they have to take, uh, take care of kids less than two years, they are constantly running, doing laundry, cooking, fixing meals, uh, fixing beds. So staying active throughout the day is important, or is as important than uh, as physical activity. Um, so instead of going round and round to find the closest parking uh, um, spot in the mall, or the grocery store over holidays, you'll be the one happiest to park the furthest mm -hmm. and walk, right? Uh, so things like that. Um, here is what, uh, you know, the, um, because we spend long hours in front of the computer, now there are basically computers where you have, the table is at a level where you can stand and do your dictations or work on the computer. Uh, there are even treadmills attached to these computer stations where you can walk slowly while you're doing it. But even more important is if you have a sedentary uh, life and you're on the phone and computer a lot, make it a point, set your um, cell phone alarm. Every hour, get up and do something for at least two minutes. When get water, don't get soda, don't go to the uh, vending machine, but get up and walk, uh, move around, you know, stretch. Um, when you're on the phone, that's the best time, right? Walk around your table, round and round, with, while you're talking to somebody on the phone. If there is something that you can go down the corridor and talk to somebody, take that opportunity <coughs> to go down the corridor instead of picking up the phone and calling. So staying active throughout the day is very um, the amount of, so when we take a pound of human fat and burn it in a laboratory, basically that, that you need 3,500 calories to burn a pound of fat. So um, for somebody like me, so I weigh 125 pounds, I'm five foot five inches. If I run for 30 minutes and cover three miles in 30 minutes, how much energy do you think I spent running three miles in 30 minutes? 200. I did it this morning, it was 195. So on a good day, adding the warm up and the thing is about 200. So if you really, even if you spend 300 calories working out for 45 minutes, I have to do that 10 times in a week to use a pound. What do you think will happen to me if I work out 10 times at that level of physical activity? I'm going to feel hungry. Have you ever ramped up physical activity or started physical activity? At 10 o'clock in the morning, you are so hungry that you will eat anything, even paper, if you don't get food in your hand. Right? <laughs> that is physically, you become extremely hungry. So you're going to be then increasing your calorie intake. So you cannot um, lose weight by doing physical activity. If your ideal body weight, by you, you can maintain it with physical activity, but you need to restrict calories. So this is some idea, what is light physical activity, what is moderate physical activity, and what's vigorous physical activity. Vigorous physical activity is if you're able to jog six miles per hour or at a rate of six to eight miles per hour, that's vigorous physical activity. Moderate activity is if you're able to uh, walk at three to four miles per hour, that's moderate physical activity, and anything less than that is basically light physical activity. So whenever you use any formula to calculate how much energy you need or how much weight you should lose, and they always ask you moderately physically active or are you a light physically active person or a vigorous person, this is what you can use. If you exercise at least five days at a rate of six to eight miles, you can consider yourself vigorously physical active. Most of us fall into the moderate, most of us who exercise routinely fall into the moderate category, uh, and some of us fall into the light. But don't get upset, here's the benefit. This is what's important, right? Look at the, uh, the group A is people who are doing low level physical activity. Group B is moderate and group C is intense physical activity. Where is the maximum benefit when people who are very sedentary got out and did low level of physical activity? They got the most amount of benefit. And then from moderate to uh, low to moderate, there is also some benefit. But from moderate to high, you plateau quite a bit. And if you are struggling from weight, then you will unfortunately increase your risk for mechanical injuries, arthritis, back pain, and that will set you back significantly. So if you're somebody who's very physically active, you're young and you can do it, keep going. But the biggest thing is 
get moving. Right? So there is a potential that we could have. Um, general, so general health benefit, if you have risk for heart problems, you want to be able to exercise for 30 minutes five times a week. If you want to lose weight, you have to do 30 minutes seven days a week. Unfortunately, once you've lost weight, more than 10% of your body weight, every attempt the body makes to regain the weight. That's why we always struggle with weight loss with uh, modalities. Whatever we choose, we are constantly struggling with weight regain. So it, once you've lost 10% of your body weight, your hunger hormones are raising high, and your satiety hormones are the hormones that make you pull up very, very suppressed, and this lasts even up to two years. So it becomes important to be able to exercise at least 60 minutes five days a week to be able to maintain this. Um, we do write an exercise prescription whenever possible. Can you come up with something? I can't recommend somebody to play basketball if they don't play basketball, if they don't have friends. So it, it doesn't make any sense for me to repeat and say walk every day for 30 minutes if the patient doesn't enjoy walking or they have horrible arthritis that they're unable to walk. So come up with a plan with your friend, your colleague. What do you enjoy the most? What do you think you can do? It can be somebody who's wheelchair dependent, basically having two uh, sand bags or two uh, Coke bottles filled with water, and every time there is a commercial, lifting and doing some uh, you know, biceps curls like seven times, right? So come up with what you want the patient to do or what the patient is willing to do, the frequency, the intensity, for how long, and then you want the patient to come back and tell you how much they're enjoying it. Because if they're not enjoying it and they're frustrated and they're hurting, you can't take up the maintenance program. So this is called the FIT prescription that we write for patients with celiac. All right, so 52 year old woman is ready to embark on a program to lose weight through calorific and moderate physical activity. Which of the, one of the following is true about behavior techniques for weight loss? So you can keep reminding patients about eat less, exercise more, here's the biggest benefit. You have to get them motivated and change their behavior to make sure they last long. So keeping a food diary is the most effective behavior strategy. Psychotherapy is an effective method of weight loss. Group weight loss classes are, are, are not as effective as individual counseling, or behavior strategies play only a small role in losing weight. Okay. So keeping a food diary where you're basically monitoring and you're being aware of what you're taking in. Then, so if you realize that you walk for 30 minutes and lost 200 calories, when you grab a bag of M&Ms that has 210 calories, you will at least think twice. How can you keep a food diary? You can do it the old fashioned way by keeping a piece of paper and writing everything you drink, drink and uh, eat. Nowadays, if any of you have a smartphone, there are free apps that you can download. One of the easiest one is called My Fitness Pal, as everybody can uh, use it. So it's very easy, especially for college kids and people who are, you, you can scan all your items or you put Weight Watchers chicken um, burger and it automatically has how many calories, how much protein it is, and it keeps adding up. And then at four o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon, it gives you reminders that you've exceeded your protein and you haven't had enough protein. Enough carbohydrates, it gives you recipes at the end of the week if you want to. I have no shares in the app. It's free. Anybody can download it and use it. Guess when it works if you use it 100% of the time. What's the name of My Fitness Pal. There is so many other ones. Uh, the Livestrong, you know, the, uh, the uh, company has one called My Place. You can use that. Anything. They're all free apps. Sorry. That's right. So you can use so many of these and figure out what works best for you. Um, for home cooks, like people who cook and fix meals, they are a little bit more cumbersome because you have to then, when you're cooking, think about a, a teaspoon of olive oil, half a cup of dry legume, a little bit more difficult. Right? Uh, but on the other hand, if you ever do it, um, my uh, recommendation is when you have a free time, say, you know, um, uh, in the summer if you have a bee cough, if you ever do it 100% of the time for a bee, then the rest of the year, sometimes up to two years, you're conscientious about what you're eating and you know how much calories you're putting in and how much you're going in. Uh, but these things work very well for a lot of young people who eat out a lot and who eat frozen food. Um, behavior therapy. So we use this, um, uh, the five A's, whenever you want to make change, first is asking the patient. This can, uh, this applies for uh, 
patients who smoke, patients who want to lose weight, low salt diet, anything. It makes sense to first ask the patient. You have a patient who comes in because they they have a cough and a cold, and they recently um, have had bronchitis in the ER that they're coming to see you. And then if you find out that they're smoking, which you should always, and then you tell them, um, it makes sense to ask, um, probably your lung infection got worse, or is, uh, maybe was contributed by smoking. Uh, have you ever thought about quitting? Are you ready to, do you need my help? If the patient says no, don't waste a lot of time, but even advise them at that point to say, you know what, this does increase your risk for heart problem, lung cancer. Will it be okay if you come back in a month's time to talk about it, but now that you're sick, we'll concentrate on this. Or even offering the patient, I'm available when you're ready, call or make an appointment, we'll talk about it. Similarly, when it comes to obesity, it makes sense to talk to the patient. This is what your BMI is. Will it be okay if we talk about the weight? And if they say no, then always give them an opening to come back again in the future to talk about it. Assess complications of it, advise what you want them to do, or come up with a plan, agree, and then arrange and assist. Um, for weight loss, from insurance purposes, Medicare, Medical covers uh, monthly visits, or even twice a month visits for six months to manage obesity that's a comorbidity. So your insurance covers that number of visits. Uh, so 12 visits a month uh, in the first six months, then once a month for the next six months, and then every three months for the second year for just managing obesity and comorbidities. So your insurance does cover these things. Um, so uh, these are some of the things. Here I'm going to um, you know, sort of move out and, out and uh, talk to things that you can do over the holiday and the season to uh, maintain your weight. Over the holidays, whether you're actively trying to lose weight or you want to maintain your weight. My goal is to try and maintain your weight starting before Halloween, right? If you maintain your weight till after the New Year, then you can come up with a plan to lose further weight if you want to. So what are the simple things that you can do to be able to uh, maintain your weight over the holidays? All right, so this uh, Thursday, um, I mean, tonight, there is a, a Christmas meal or a Thanksgiving meal, and you've been invited. Um, how can you prevent eating too much calories during your holiday dinner? Any idea? Yes, that's the best thing. So prepare yourself that you don't get there hungry. What's the best thing to eat? Have an apple, have some fresh uh, vegetables. Um, when we say vegetables, we don't talk about carrots and potatoes being vegetables. They are roots. Uh, they're not. So uh, anything that grows above the soil, basically. Celery, broccoli, um, lettuce, spinach, um, green peas, that's for you. So have some vegetables or fruits before you get there, right? And make a conscious decision. If there is alcohol or punch without alcohol and a lot of appetizers with breads and chips in the main meal, make a decision to either have the liquid calorie or to have the chips and it. Don't go for both, basically. If having a beer or a glass of wine is important, then avoid the chips and the bread and then concentrate on the meal. And then when it's a booking meal, look at the food and decide which ones you definitely have to have and which ones you can go without instead of serving a little bit of everything. Um, and eat slowly when you're eating. When you slow down the process of eating, you realize and your, your brain is telling you you're full as opposed to when you eat fast, before your brain realizes that you're full, you have had another 50% extra calories. So eat slowly when you're eating and have water between, you know, to slow the process down. Talk to a friend instead of watching the TV when you're eating. When you're watching the TV, there's this constant stimulation. Cheerios ad, um, um, you know, Hershey's ad, um, all these ads are constantly stimulating your brain to increase your appetite as opposed to when you talk to a friend, you basically slow down the eating process and you become aware. Um, there are eating disorders. Um, next slide. Um, uh, there are weight loss medications. So unfortunately, we have hundred, hundred uh, tablets, uh, hundred different types of medications for diabetes. Six, um, about hundred and sixty different medications for um, high blood pressure, and we have only about five medicines that FDA approved for weight loss. These have FDA approval long term, meaning you can use it for two years, three years after after um, you've achieved weight loss to maintain the weight. Uh, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Um, so the uh, fentramine was FDA approved in 1980. Unfortunately, you can only use it for three months out of the year because it can, you can become dependent on the medication. The other options are uh, Olistat, which was pulled off the market because there was con concern with contamination of glass on the medication. It's 
fat in the market is available over the counter, it binds to fat and prevents absorption. So in a 60 milligram dose, it's available over the counter. You can prescription dose is 120 milligrams three times a day. Unfortunately, if you take that and have a heavy uh, fat meal, you will have a soil of stool and stool in your uh, we achieved quite a bit of weight loss with this medication. It's a combination of very low dose of metronine with a feature medication called Tocomax. We've been uh, able to achieve this with the help of the dietitians and exercise physiologists, even achieving a, 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 about 12% weight loss. Uh, so unfortunately, what we spoke about earlier, when you lose weight, it becomes harder. Your um, hormones that makes you feel full can last at very low levels after you've lost. Uh, <laughs> they keep going down after six months, and they remain low. Your uh, satiety hormones remain low after two years after weight loss. And the hormones that make you feel full, uh, make you feel hunger goes up and remains high after two years. That's the struggle with weight loss. Um, so this is just to show some of the surgeries that we have. Um, so this is the oldest and the most uh, uh, mostly used surgery up to a year and a half ago, which is called gastric bypass. You basically reduce the size of the stomach and you make a small loop of small bubble and really can connect it to the pouch that's there. So by doing that, you're reducing absorption from the most of the stomach and the proximal part of the small bubble as well. So you feel full and you're also null absorbing. So unfortunately, because of the null absorption from most of the stomach and some of the small bowel, they are at risk for iron deficiency anemia, low protein. Uh, next slide. So the, um, this was becoming very uh, common because it could be easily done without a surgery, where you put a band to uh, you know, sort of restrict the stomach and patients are able to lose weight. Um, the longer the band stayed in uh, beyond a year, it started slipping, sometimes causing ulcers. So it's, it's becoming less fashionable to use them. Um, so this is the most common gastric uh, weight loss surgery that we've done. It's called sleep gastrectomy, where they go and remove two thirds of the stomach and leaving like a banana shaped stomach. By doing that, you feel full early and also you will stay, uh, the food stays in the stomach longer, so you feel full longer. Um, these are the endoscopy treatments that UCI offers. They can put in a, a balloon during an endoscopic procedure and leave the balloon in for six months. And people have lost about uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 percent of weight loss. The problem is when the balloon comes off, if you haven't got on board with lifestyle changes, then you regain the weight back. Uh, they also do an endoscopic sleep gastroplasty. They do endoscopically go and sort of stitch the stomach and make the stomach much smaller. And people, so this has been, we've been doing this at UCI for the last six months, so we don't have long-term record. So how much we are able to achieve and how much long-term benefit. Um, and then the biggest thing that they're able to do is for patients who are gaining weight after gastric bypass, they can go and make the pouch smaller and also make the anastomotic, yeah, the stomach joint with the small bowel smaller, so they will get more weight loss after because they feel full again. 